While farmers work hard to grow the best crop, their Iowa Corn Checkoff investments are working to foster industry connections to help companies replace petroleum with corn. Additional research is finding even more uses for corn and discovering new ways and practices to help farmers get the most out of their crop. The Iowa Corn Checkoff, working hard for Iowa's corn farmers. Go to iowacorn.org to learn more. With Robinhood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robinhood Gold allows the resourceful individual to earn the very liberal rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Get the privileges of the high net worth for any net worth for just $5 a month. Sign up at Robinhood.com gold. Terms apply for product-specific disclosures. Visit Robinhood.com gold. Investing involves risk. Rate may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold. LLT. Taking shots, we alive from the mountains to the coast. We gon' bring that fire in the heart of college football. We the ones they admire. Yeah. Yo, it's game day, stadium packed. Feel that rush from Boise to App State. Man, we never hush. Rocking the colors, yeah, we bleed that pride. Cinderella stories, watch our dreams collide. Late nights, bright lights, we grind every play. Underrated talent, we gon' make them say. Who's that team when we come to town? Representing for the schools that wear the crown. We in the G5, high buzzing loud, we thrive. When the dogs rising up, take a shot. Forward gets out of a tackle, now turns on the Jets, up to the 30, the 20, 10, 5, Torrey Hart, back to the end zone. Oh. yard play, guess who, body, up the middle, making another move, to the outside, 15, 10, end zone again. Nice move by Brown, he's got space, he's got six. 35-yard touchdown for Byron Brown, a record-setting night for the South Florida quarterback. Yeah, so far, a little bit of a high snap. Jenty right up the middle. Jenty has room. Ashton Jenty, give him six. Second and low. Lagarde tries to beat it. G5 all the time. Welcome to a special episode of the G5 High. We have a special guest today with us, uh, Brian Phillips, owner of Big Blue USU Aggie News. There's been a the last, I don't know, since Monday, I guess, there's been a lot of news on the Mountain West, conference realignment, um, some uh, some NIL and uh, UNLV news today. And we thought it'd be great to get Brian on and, and kind of get his thoughts kind of Walk us through the, the timeline of of how we got to where we are to today in terms of uh, Utah State joining joining the uh, the Pac-12. So, I guess it all started last year. Um, all the all the other Pac-12 schools left. Um, you had Oregon and uh, Washington going to the Big Ten. Um, Stanford and Cal go to the ACC, and everybody else goes to the Big to the big 12 that leaves Oregon state and Washington state as the only two remaining members. Um, They came to an interim agreement um, with the mountain West for football scheduling or or does that include all sports? Do you know, Brian? Um, It was just football only. So they came to that interim agreement with the mountain West for football scheduling. Um, They weren't quote technically part of the mountain West, but they're, they're like the Notre Dame of the ACC, I guess is the best way to put it. Right. Quasi Mountain West, um, and I think in that agreement wasn't there like a at, at the end of the day if if the Pac-12 took all Mountain West members they owed nothing but if they only took certain members was there like a forty million dollar poaching fee do I have that number right or off the top of my head I believe it was thirty okay um, but that also was dependent on whether they snagged enough schools or enough schools like say for instance air force possibly moved on to the aac um the remaining the members could vote to dissolve the mountain west uh everybody had a vote except for hawaii with them not being a full member 
And in the event that everybody voted to dissolve, then there were no uh, fees owed. And, and when you talk about the teams that have the vote, if Air Force were to have been to leave, they don't have a vote, or do they? Right. If you, if you choose to leave, you no longer have a vote. So that happens, um, you know, off, during this offseason, I guess. Um, the NCAA, and I, and I get confused, it, it, they either made them – they made them the same as the rest of the G5. I don't remember if that's considered autonomous or non-autonomous, but basically they're, they're, they're considered the same as the G5 today, and they have two years to get back to at least eight members. And I assume at that point, then they can petition to come, come back to the table. Is that correct? I believe so. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, the P4 are going to be the P4, and uh, the money grab has taken place, and they'll shut out everyone they possibly can. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, right? I think a lot of people, a lot of people, have this misconception that when the Pac-12 gets to eight members, that they automatically become a, a, a P5 um, or you know a P4 today. Um, but I agree with you 100%. That's not going to happen. Like those other four conferences. They're not going to vote for it, right? But now, I think the G5 would vote for it, right? Because that's one less conference to have to compete with them for an automatic spot. If um, they had, if they had a say, so absolutely. Um, I think they they have one say, so right? Don't they have one vote? The, the G5 collectively, I think. Correct. Clearly outvoted, though. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um. So, you know, they have two years to get to that status, to get to get to at least eight members to become a consider be considered a full conference and I guess petition to get back that power status. So fast forward, I guess, to um, was it last week? And they convinced four Mountain West teams to jump ship. Well, that was, I guess, a week and a half ago. Is that right? Right. It, oh, roughly. It's probably been about two weeks, actually. Give or, give or take a day or two. And that was Colorado State, Boise State, Fresno State, and San Diego State? Yes. So they get to six. And then and then they make the announcement, hey, you know, our, our strategy is like go big or go home, I guess is what I would call it. Um, they, they – at least that's what they – that's what – as an outsider, that's what it looked like to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they went after, like, some of the, the bigger programs in the G5, like a, a Memphis, a South Florida, uh, a Tulane. Um, and, and Texas San Antonio. UTSA, okay. Yeah. But then Monday morning, those four schools reaffirmed that, hey, we're staying in the, in the AAC. Correct. Um, we talked about on our show, I think, if they had decided to leave, they would have each owed, like, $27.5 million exit fee. So that's the number being thrown around, yeah. Not about that's a big reason why they decided not to leave. Um, so then you know, the Pac 12 has to kind of regroup, if you will. And I, I think everyone at that point, everyone was, I think, really looking at UNLV and Air Force and maybe, um, who else like New Mexico State and, and UTEP just because they make sense from a geographical standpoint. That at one point in time, New Mexico State was bunched in with everybody when it was the WAC and UTEP the same. So there's there's familiarity there. I, I don't think those kind of talks were ever serious, to be honest. Yeah. And those are just like from outside looking in, right? What other right. people are talking about. Obviously, like Mountain West, Pac-12, they keep the stuff to themselves for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Um, so then we then then you know it looks like UNLV and our Air Force have said, hey, we're gonna stay. And and the remaining eight members of the Mountain West are gonna sign this agreement um, to stay as the Mountain West. And then sometime Monday evening, Utah State says, Not so fast, my friend. We're going to the Pac 12. Can you kind of walk us through, I guess, that decision? Um, what do you what do you think it means for uh, Utah State and perhaps what led to it and why they decided to do it. Well, going back 40, 40 years or so, Utah State has been 
continuously left behind, so to speak. We were left out of the WAC when the WAC first formed. Um, and then the WAC once again had to kind of regroup once uh, eight of those teams left and formed the Mountain West. You know, 20, 25 years ago or so, the WAC was a 16 team conference that stretched from Utah to Texas and Tulsa and stuff like that. So they had to, they had to regroup. Then we still got left out. And then when the mountain West added a couple of different schools, um, Fresno and Nevada, that's when we finally got the call up to the WAC. And so we joined the WAC then and eventually moved on to the mountain West three or so years later, once Utah and BYU chose to move on and BYU on to independence, uh, Utah on to the Pac-12. And so that's how we slipped into the Mountain West. And we've been there for, oh, 11 years or so. Bid, so when you got, you know, you come to Monday night and – like what? Why do you think Utah State administration said, "Hey, this is like this is the place for us to be"? When we finally have a chance uh, to move on to a bigger and better situation, we finally had a we finally got an administration in place that saw the value in doing so and leaving behind some of our peer schools, even though these peer schools honestly speaking, have never looked out for us. Wyoming, San Jose, uh, New Mexico, Nevada, those guys have never cared about where Utah State landed. So in this day and age, it's every man for himself. And we decided to follow where the better programs are. And the better programs, the more stable programs, and potentially more money lies with the pack seven right now so we i don't think we ever seriously entertained staying with the mountain west we were always intending on if a pack six twelve what whatever we're going to call it at this point in time invitation came we were always going to accept one thing that I found a little bit inter interesting, and uh, I'm not sure if you have any insight at all on this, Brian, is is the, the Air Force situation. Because it, it seemed to me like the natural inclination would, would be they'd want to join the American to be with Army and Navy. But it doesn't necessarily seem like that's really the case. So a week or so ago, may, maybe eight, nine days ago, the Air Force Academy was in talks with the AAC. So that, that actually did take place, and I'm not sure how far that progressed. Clearly not far enough that they're a member as of today. And yesterday, when they reaffirmed with the Mountain West, they were basically deemed a flagship school. So one of the, one of the faces of, of the conference. So at this point in time, if the remaining seven schools stay together – then Air Force is right at the top of the conference as far as being being the face of the being the face of the Mountain West. You know, one thing that the Mountain West announced Monday, I guess, that they were doing to try to entice schools to not leave was basically taking those exit fees, that poaching fee, and going to disperse that back to the members. Um. One thing Luke and I talked about on our show Monday night was from a fine, and this is only thinking in terms of pure financials, wouldn't it just make more sense for the Pac-12 just to try to absorb them all and then no one owes any fees? I think that's probably still plan maybe C or D. Okay. It, it really just depends on a couple of other moves that have been thrown out within social media and the national sports world and stuff like that. So you've heard Gonzaga tossed around and you've heard Hawaii tossed around. UNLV is still very much on the fence. 
Um, I have a source that let me know this morning that as of last night, UNLV was still leaning towards staying with the Mountain West. But I believe I read just in the last hour or two that the Nevada Board of Regents is going to have basically like an emergency meeting tomorrow to discuss the UNLV and Nevada Reno um, situation, wh whether they can be separated and Nevada is free to accept a Pac-12 bid or, or what the case may be. So we may get some more clarity as early as tomorrow, but you know, with it being in the Western time zone, maybe not till Friday. You know, you mentioned Gonzaga, another school I've heard thrown around, at least for, for basketball only, was mm -hmm. Connecticut as well. Um, Connecticut's kind of an interesting one. Um, I know that they've recently tried to, I think, get in the Big Ten or the Big 12. I'm assuming, you know, basketball being their main selling point, right? Um, definitely you know, men's and women's basketball, their league, right? Um, right. The, football, the football program, uh, not so much. But I don't know, like – I guess they wouldn't want to do all sports just from a travel standpoint um, and, and only be, only doing basketball. But, yeah, that's another interesting one. Um, let, let's assume for a moment that the Pac-12 and the Mountain West are going to remain as independent conferences. Um, what do you think the next move is for the Pac-12? Who do you think, like, the, the their, if they could pick who's at the top of their list? It's tough to say because it's been such a crapshoot <laughs> so far. You know, when you've got the AA schools that have already said no, where do you turn? Do you try to continue to cherry pick the Mountain West? And if you do, who do you snag? Do you snag Nevada? Do you snag New Mexico? Uh, when, when you're having Gonzaga tossed around, then you kind of get, gravitate towards possibly New Mexico because that tells you that there's kind of a value and a focus on basketball. And New Mexico has been quite strong under Richard Pitino for the last three or four seasons. So New Mexico comes to mind right off. And I don't know whether you try and snag some lower level AAC teams you know, maybe a Texas state or something like that doesn't really seem realistic to me, but you know, only the, the guys that are in charge of the PAC 12 really know what the next step is. I think they really believed in their heart of hearts that they'd be able to get the four AAC schools and then they'd have their eight and then I think Utah State and UNLV would have fallen into the pecking order to make 10. So it, clearly a monkey wrench into that plan. It would it would seem to me that perhaps there could be a, a bit of a race between the Mountain West and perhaps the Pac-12 to kind of go after New Mexico State and, and um, UTEP from Conference USA. Um, it just seems like, you know, the, the, from a – uh, a, a, a location or a regionality standpoint, right? Those would make them the next fit. And you could have two conferences courting them, I guess. I don't really see the Pac-12 and the seven current members now settling on New Mexico State and UTEP. They're not super competitive programs often. Yeah. And right now, the, the idea is to try and make your conference as strong as possible, which is why they try to snag Utah State and UNLV. You know, Utah State has continuously been left behind, but everywhere that they land, they manage to compete in football and basketball very, very quickly. You know, it, it doesn't take long for us to get into a new conference situation and compete right away. Hoops has almost always stepped right in almost seamlessly and competed from day one. Football takes a year or two to kind of bring in there, at least in the past to bring in the type, the recruits uh, to be able to compete from a uh, depth and um, talent level with the 
addition of the transfer portal, rebuilding can happen in a year now. So the the old adage that it takes you three, four years to bring your guys in and you need recruiting class after recruiting class to really build the depth and the quality of talent that you want out the window, out the window now. Now, now, do you think the Mountain West, West perhaps, would look at UTEP and New Mexico State in particular? Or I, I don't see why not. Again, those are teams that are, are schools that are familiar with the remaining schools. They've all shared a conference at some point in time or, or another. So, again, like you've said, geographically, it makes sense. I'm not hearing a lot of talk about wanting to – cherry pick from say the summit league and and maybe go after some of the Dakota schools or the big sky and, and maybe approach Weber state or or someone like that. I haven't heard any talk like that yet. So I I think it's still very much in the um, wait and see stage. Yeah. I mean, I guess the the, the problem with, with those um, FCS schools is, you know, to move for them to move up the football, I think it's a $5 million fee. Now they have to pay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess if, if the mountain West really wanted one of those schools, I assume they could, they could say, Hey, we're going to pay that $5 million for you from the exit fee from these other schools. Um, I honestly don't think the Dakota schools or want to do Montana's yeah, Montana, so <laughs> Montana state. I, I don't think they'd struggle coming up with that kind of money to be honest. But I, I don't know. They want to do it either though. Maybe not. Maybe not. That's why it hasn't really been kicked around that I've seen. Yeah. So. It, it seems like maybe some of the, uh, the the smaller, you know, the Texas schools, some of those schools, I think, are more, I guess, inclined, in my opinion, to, to make a jump up than, right. than like you said, the, the Montana's, Montana states or North Dakota's or South Dakota states of right. the world. Those, so, I think those guys are happy where they are. So, Brian – what is like? What's the big benefit if if the Pac-12 doesn't really get into that P4, go back to the P5 and they you know stay at that lower level? What is the benefit of going to the Pac-12 as opposed to staying in the Mountain West? Is it just the level of competition and the strength of the conference? And like, then at what point is it, you know, like what's that money differential? What what is that benefit? I guess between the two. So. The first thing that I've been talking about to anybody that has asked is perception. You know, if you're a recruit, uh, the family of a recruit, friend of a recruit, whatever the case may be, you don't necessarily follow the Mountain West religiously. And so you're not super familiar with who's where, but you are familiar with the Pac-12 brand. You know what the name is. You, You know the weight that it's carried all these decades. And so it's huge from a recruiting standpoint for us to be able to associate ourselves with the Pac-12 brand. Everybody recognizes it. And so it should open doors to a whole other tier of high school recruit. Definitely, you know, transfer portal, not so much just because Kids are already in school and have been places and moved around and so on and so forth. But from a from a high school and, and a junior college level to some extent, being able to push the Pac-12 brand and that we're a member of that is just going to be huge. Another benefit for us will be what is being perceived as going to be a increase in television money. I've seen anywhere from 12 to $15 million kind of kicked around. Right now, we've been receiving $5 million from the Mountain West. So for a school like Utah State to be able to move to an upper-level conference and start pulling in at least double what we've been getting, that's huge. That's huge from a monetary standpoint for a school like Utah State. Now, what one of the Mountain West teams that seems like I don't know nobody really wants is is Hawaii, and you know even just from a football perspective, my guess is they just don't want to travel. You, you think that's the, that's the that's the main impetus there? Or? So I think that 
there is value in adding Hawaii. One, they have their own bowl game. So if you add Hawaii, you bring your bowl game with, um, you're able to sell recruits on a trip to Hawaii every other year. So I also think that there's an interest in Hawaii in the same way that there's interest in Gonzaga. So if we get to say 10 teams or maybe even 11 football playing programs, so you get to 10 dual programs, football and basketball playing, and you want say a 20 game football or 20 game basketball schedule, excuse me, you add Gonzaga, you've got that as your 11th team. The P4 schools have kind of been kicking around an idea that they should have a 10 game conference schedule and, and then just, you know, a couple of a, a pair of non-conference um, games each year. So in the event that the Pac-12 wanted to do that, you have your, again, your 10, whoever those may be, uh, dual programs, then you add Hawaii to offset Gonzaga. And now you've got a football member only and a hoops member only. Yeah, and you're at your Pac-12. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, but I'm not in charge. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I mean, the thing that makes the most sense to me is they just invite the whole Mountain West and then nobody owes any fees. Um, but it, I don't I don't know. I, I mean, it's. I think some other dominoes would have to happen for that to kind of take more shape. Like, I think... Right. Like, air, like Air Force jumping to the AAC, right? Um, right. You know, things like that. Um, I, I, I don't I'm, really think Air Force has much interest in remaining if UNLV ends up taking off. So what's that relationship there that, like, they would be that key figure that leaves and then they're like, okay, well, we don't want to be here. Uh, maybe so. May, maybe so, because then you're you're talking about one of your stronger, um, at least hoops programs, and clearly this season an upstart football program, uh, moving on to the Pac-12, and now you're down to six members. Who are you going to add? You know, if, if the AAC comes back around and says, "Okay, well, let's talk Air Force," I think if they were able to come to an agreement, Air Force would take off as well. Do you? Do you think um, at the end of the day that uh, UNLV is just like holding out for the highest bidder or do you think, I mean. No, 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 I don't. Um, I, I think they're kind of torn. Um, I think that they see value in remaining in the Mountain West because at this point in time, they're feeling pretty good about themselves as far as football goes. And so I think they see themselves as potentially a big fish in a small pond. So they, they, again, you're talking flagship program and they see themselves as being potentially one of those, one of those top dogs in the mountain West. Whereas you move on to the PAC 12, you're back with schools that are, are good, frankly going to be more competitive, both in basketball and football. And so they need to try and decide whether they want to move up and earn a little bit more TV money and accept the clout that kind of comes with being a member of the Pac-12 or remain with the Mountain West, hope that everybody can hold it together. They'll, they'll, everybody will pick one school up somewhere. I mean, you have to. You yeah. have to. If everybody stays put, you have to find a, another football and basketball player playing member. Both both program or both conferences, so it, it's just kind of a stalemate, and it may just they may just be waiting on the the board of regents meeting tomorrow, and see what kind of leeway they're given in regards to being able to move with or without Nevada. Other than the AAC kind of courting Air Force, have you heard any other conferences interested in any other Mountain West schools? Like, I'm, I'm a little surprised maybe Conference USA hasn't been tossed around trying to recruit some of those schools. Conference USA has been in talks with Hawaii. Okay. And other than that, that that's all I know. Conference USA has contacted Hawaii in the event that talks between 
them and the Mountain West and the Pac-12 stall out. And they decide they need a conference landing spot. Well, going back to UNLV, I guess before before we get to this, anything else you want to add on this uh, conference realignment things? Maybe what, what you would like to see. Like, if you have – you could pick anybody. Who would you pick for that last spot? While farmers work hard to grow the best crop, their Iowa corn checkoff investments are working to foster industry connections to help companies replace petroleum with corn. Additional research is finding even more uses for corn and discovering new ways and practices to help farmers get the most out of their crop. The Iowa Corn Checkoff, working hard for Iowa's corn farmers. Go to iowacorn.org to learn more. With Robinhood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robinhood Gold allows the resourceful individual to earn the very liberal rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Get the privileges of the high net worth for any net worth for just $5 a month. Sign up at Robinhood.com gold. Terms apply for product-specific disclosures. Visit Robinhood.com gold. Investing involves risk. Rate may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold. LLT. At this point in time, UNLV, UNLV, they, they've got, again, they keep, I keep going back to Gonzaga being tossed around. So they've kind of got an upstart basketball program. They, they pulled in a pretty good recruiting class this year. They've got uh, Deedon Thomas Jr. at point guard. That's just a phenomenal player. So the basketball team should add value right away. The football program, are they going to be able to hold on to Coach Odom or Coach Marion, the offensive coordinator? You know, those guys are kind of the architect of what they've got going on this season. So I think they're going to be in high demand. Is Nevada going to be able – or is UNLV going to be able to hang, hang on to them? That, that's going to be a wait and see come December. So but I, 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 would, I, I would hope that UNLV still jumps. You, you get you, you get that, conference tournaments there. Your basketball tournament, you can hold a you can hold a football uh, championship game there. Yeah. So there, there's lots of perks. I mean, it's always it's rather warm year round, so it's always a travel destination for an opposing fan base. When you talk about Coach Odom and, and you know the the football side of things, having the coaches like, hey, how can we keep them here? Do you think that jump to the Pac-12 then maybe helps in a leverage point in keeping them with UNLV, or is that something like like not that important in the grand scheme of things? We've got bigger fish that we're trying to take care of and and whatnot. I think again, it comes back to the perception, right? So when you're perceived, when the perception is is that you're in a more prestigious conference. And that that will be the outsider looking in. That that will be their perception. Oh wow, you know, Pac-12 is knocking on my door. They want me. So sure, I, I think that there will be maybe a little added incentive to remain at UNLV if they move on to the Pac-12. But as we all know, money talks, and if a P4 program comes knocking on the door of Coach Odom or or an offensive coordinator gig opens up for Coach Marion, you know, the, the mighty the almighty dollar is gonna talk. Yeah, I think the best you could hope for is ultimately like if they move to the Pac 12, it means more money. They can give those guys more money, but right. it just probably delays the inevitable, right? I mean, I just feel like that's the world of G5 sports in, at all. Like that's what you want, right? You want your coaches to be poached because that means you are successful. Um, and that's what's going to happen when you are successful, right? And so that just kind of comes with the the territory in today's college football or college you know, sports landscape in general. Right. There, there's just that there, it, it's just most schools place in the pecking order. Yep. So since so we started talking about that UNLV football team, we had some I woke up to this news. I guess it, it came out pretty late last night. Um, and that's quarterback Matt Saluka um, has announced he is basically redshirting, sitting out the rest of the season um, to preserve his year of eligibility. 
Um, you know, his, his side of the story is he was made promises. Those promises weren't kept. Um, UNLV, UNLV's side of the story, as you might imagine, is quite different that they kept these promises. Um, you know, the, the things I heard, I, I know Bud Elliott talked talked about it earlier today on, on his podcast. And I guess he he had a conversation with Matt's brother. And according to Bud, that conversation, those conversations, basically Matt was made given a verbal commitment from a staff member. Um, there was never a contract, um, but the, the verbal commitment was made. There was a, I guess, in his opinion, a shared understanding. The number being thrown around is a hundred thousand um, dollars, and then he never got any of that. Um, and then when he went to um, head coach's office to talk about it, the story was that he's like, "I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't make that. I didn't make those commitments to you." Um, and of course, the collective says the same thing, right? We don't have any agreements to offer him that kind of money. Um, you know. The rumors I've heard is that a, a certain offensive coordinator is the one that made those those gestures, um, which I feel like he's been tied to those kind of things in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't I, so I don't know, like if folks are just using that as a way to tie him to it or not. I don't I don't I don't know the truth. Um, maybe one day we'll get the truth. Right. I, I feel like there's two sides of the stories. Right. And, and the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. That's typically typically the way it goes. But I mean, you know. And then to add more fuel to it later this afternoon, um, and this one's not going to make the headlines because he wasn't a starter. But uh, running back Michael Allen has essentially did the same thing. Now he's he, the best I can tell, he hasn't made any claims in terms of NIL money. I think you know he says commitments weren't kept. My guess is, from his perspective, those are probably more playing time commitments. Um, he thought he was going to get playing time. And he didn't get it. I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, just, I don't know, interesting, it's some interesting stuff and, and interesting stuff in the world of college football today. You know, in this NIL world, I think we far too often hear stories of players being offered money, being made promises. Then they get to where they get to, and, and none of that comes to fruition. Um, and so from that standpoint, like, I think this, if nothing else, I think this situation kind of sheds light on that subject a little bit. Um, what are you hearing out there in, um, in Utah, you know, about the situation? Really pretty much what's being kicked around social media wise, national media wise, you know, there's not enough of a connection here to, to really get down to the nitty gritty, but, and all it really boils down to is a bunch of, he said, he said, and at at this point in time, you really just get to pick sides. UNLV is without a starting quarterback. This kid's clearly going to red shirt with everything that's been thrown around and the brother making the national media rounds. And I think the dad jumped in on some stuff as well. Um, I would say that um, the bad blood has been created and there's zero chance that yeah. uh, Matt Sluka is going to go back Absolutely. and, and can change his mind and continue to be the, the quarterback of the Rebels. Um, there, there's a phrase that comes to mind and it's just, oh, what a tangled web we weave. Yes. You know, I mean, the NIL just continues to be an unregulated disaster for a lot, a lot of schools, you know, and, and it really doesn't matter how much money you have. It, it, it's just, it, it just continues to be a mess. You know, what, what we have a couple of years ago, uh, the Jaden uh, Rashada saga at Florida, yeah, at Florida yeah. led, led to his uh, transfer, you know, just, it's just a mess. It's just a mess when you have no rules or regulations and it's a free for all, it, it'll just be a free for all. And it, a free for all eventually turns into nothing but a big cluster. And that that's what UNLV has on their hands right now is nothing but well, a big cluster. Well, so like we've got people pointing the fingers, UNLV, 
Matt Saluka, whatever. Isn't this the NCAA's fault? Like, for not doing anything? Yeah, yeah. Like, that, that, should, that, shouldn't we all be looking point. there? Sure, you point the finger there uh, because it, they're the ones that, for lack of a better phrase, legalized the bag man. I mean, anybody that is a sports... Well, except, fan, except the bag man actually delivers money. <laughs> You know, so a- anybody that's been a college football fan for the last 30 or 40 years or so, you know, roundabout, everybody knows and has heard stories about bags of money showing up, especially at like your big 15 to 20 programs, you know. So all this really did was legalize the bag man and – then you have the the mini bag men mixed in, and, and the mini bag men are the ones that can't seem to to follow through on things. The- so to to me, this kind of just seems like a weird timing. So we've got Utah State's going to go to the Pac-12, and then later in the day, we hear you know late at night slash early morning, we hear you know. Luca's going to redshirt, which you can play four games. And if I'm not mistaken, they've only played three. So technically he has another game. Granted, you can, I don't want injury. I don't want this. Like at what point do you think, like put on your tinfoil cap? Like, is there anything that's related to the two of keeping UNLV in one side or the other, or like just kind of the, I guess the perception that we talked about earlier, it's like, Hey, this, the perception of UNLV is they don't give you money. So, like, we, you don't want to pack 12, keep it here, uh, Mountain West, so we can keep you down here, or not down here, but here. Then it just kind of seems weird because I'm from Iowa. I live in Iowa. There's this prominent uh, lineman who seems to go between Iowa and Alabama. But, like, you know, if he's not getting money or whatever – that happened all before the season. Like that didn't wait till right. four weeks into the season, three games into the season. Like at what point? Like, oh yeah, that's not happening. Like all of this time, it just seems weird. What's your perception of just the sheer timing? And if you want to put on a tinfoil hat, go ahead. It's awfully coincidental. Uh, I, I don't, know how the two would be related but what one would assume with them having a bye week that maybe potentially um there's a possibility for some tampering and, and that maybe maybe another program is you know uh made made certain monetary promises that he feels like maybe they'll deliver and so it's well I'll step away from UNLV and I'll sit out and you know really we won't know and and won't have much of a clue really until the transfer portal opens in December and maybe we see where he ends up you know if if you're looking at social media people are just tearing him to shreds and saying he's never going to play again and I I I can't imagine that that's the case. Yeah, he's going to play somewhere now. Yeah, he'll he'll play somewhere. I don't know that it's going to be at Alabama, right? But I think he'll play somewhere. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see once the transfer portal opens how quickly he ends up at a new school. So sometimes the quick turnaround is all the indication you need, so to speak. You know, uh, somebody hits the transfer portal and they announce where they're going the next day. Not or they're real like sneaky, preferred. not real sneaky, dude. Well, yeah, or they're preferred where they walk. And it's like, don't talk to me. Can I already know where I'm going? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and there's a there's they a term for that, right? They can mark a do not contact. Yeah, exactly, because they already know where they're going. That's what I was so, going to say. Right. Well, I guess one thing from all of this, I think. Um, and I alluded to it earlier, and hopefully it brings some light to other athletes when they are considering things, right? Number one, like, this hap- This isn't the first time this has happened. It's not going to be the last time where folks are made promises and those promises aren't kept, 
Um, so the, the grass isn't always greener. I think, you know, rule number one is you have to get everything in writing, right? If it's not in writing, if there's not a signed contract, it, do, it, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, you know, the, these athletes, they got to, they gotta, I don't know, hire an agent or someone that can help walk them through these kind of things. Um, you know, it sounds great when so-and-so offers you $100,000 or half a million dollars or whatever, but until you have something signed, it doesn't it doesn't mean, mean a hill of beans, right? I mean, we as a G5 Hive can say we're going to offer this quarterback a million dollars a year. But if we don't ever sign a contract, then it doesn't really mean much, right? Um, right. So guys got to kind of look out for themselves in that respect and, and make sure they get it in writing. And then I think a- another thing that um, I think – to a certain extent, the players don't necessarily understand it. I feel like the day they enter that portal, I feel like they lose some leverage, right? Oh, for sure. And, for and sure. I don't they, they've I given don't, up their scholarship at right. their previous school, and they're at the mercy of you know, you know, if you haven't entered the portal with a promise of being picked up, which, like we were just saying, is tampering for all intents and purposes. But if you just enter the portal because you don't feel like you have a role at your university and you go into the portal unsolicited, you're at the mercy of whoever. And the numbers are staggering of the amount of guys that give up a scholarship at an FBS school and never get picked up. So it's not a real it's not a real great return rate. So it's it's a crapshoot. It is nothing but a crapshoot. But is that a misconception that you like if you are under scholarship that you're under scholarship for the X amount of years? It's just that year, right? You it's an annual another... renewal. Yeah, it's an annual. Yeah, it's thing. an annual renewal. Renewal. Um, th- there was a trend for a while there of schools like making a four or five year guarantee. And that was kind of a thing for a little while, but then NIL came along and just blew that out of the water. You know, you don't you don't even hear about that anymore. You know, I'm I'm kind of surprised we haven't heard a story where so and so says that this this school's going to give them two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Well, as soon as they enter the portal, that school comes back and says, ah, nah, you know, we're going to give you fifty thousand dollars now, right? Because they know that player once that player enters the portal, they've lost that leverage, right? And I, I know that's happened. I have no doubt it's happened. I'm just shocked. Like that's never co- those kind of stories have not come out. Um, and now maybe with this, maybe with this Matt Saluka situation, we will hear more of those kinds of stories come to light, right? Um, you know, or or it's a cautionary tale to collectives nationwide that you need to start putting things in writing, or the collective and to an extent, the program is, is going to be embarrassed. So well, I, I don't think I don't think for a second that uh, the UNLV program, the UNLV collective, or Matt Sluka, for that matter, really feel that great about what's going on right now. So you know, everybody absolutely. everybody looks foolish. And, and one thing, like if even if, if you know, I think some folks don't understand. Let's say you know if they had an agreement with Sluka and it was to give him hundred thousand dollars. I would almost guarantee you he would not have gotten $100,000 to this point, right? You got to assume that money is spread out over the course of the season um, because at the end of the day, the collective has to protect themselves, right? Um, They don't, they, they, you know, let's assume he did have a contract and, you know, he he leaves today and he already collected his $100,000. They can't stop that, right? They already gave him the money. And so I think most of these agreements, at least a smart agreement anyway, would be that it's, doled out over the course of a season uh, to kind of protect your interest, if you will, in terms of this exact situation happening, a guy collecting his his money and running away after four games. Yeah, well, it, it makes total sense to me. You know, they, they, everybody has to start protecting themselves. And absolutely. sign agreements are – and the players are, are going to have to start retaining agents likely. So – yeah, that, that's kind of where we stand in the collegiate football world and, and hoops, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, college athletics in general. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, 
Justice, you got anything else? No, I, I just want to thank Brian for his time uh, today. And, you know, maybe next week when, when you get five more members, we'll bring you back on. <laughs> for sure. I'm, I'm happy to do it. I appreciate you guys bringing me back. Absolutely. I, I just I have one last question because this has been quite the season for Utah State. And when we do our Worker Bee Series next year, we'll be talking about the roller coaster ride that was of 2024, where we head coach late departure, and then now we're part of the Pac-12 and whatever that looks like. What, from a fan uh, perspective, what has this journey been like up to this point? Uh, a lot of uncertainty when when. Coach Anderson was let go. A lot of uncertainty, a um, lot of confusion. Uh, I, I'm just speaking as a fan base in general, and, I, and I'm using feedback that I've gotten from other fans. Um, a lot of anger, to be honest. Uh, a lot of it had to do with fans liking Coach Anderson. A lot of it had to do with the timing. They, they, they didn't really like the timing either. And... Now we've moved on. Uh, the football team is sitting at one and three. So we're, we're kind of in a precarious spot now where heading into the conference season, uh, we have a bye week this week, but we are at Boise next Saturday. We're at a spot where this coaching staff really needs to try and win. You know, you want to win them all, but if you want to be retained, you're looking at meeting probably seven winning seven of the next eight or seven of the last eight. So, you know, everybody's got their work cut out for them. Uh, the bye week will do these guys a lot of good. They can go back and kind of reset and move into the conference rec and into the conference schedule. Then you flip into the pac 12 and it's like just complete elation for, for a fan base that's been, used to so much bitter disappointment. It's been hard to see a lot of your conference mates move on to bigger and better things. So when it finally happens to you, it's just massive. It's massive. And so when you're looking at moving into the Pac-12 and everybody knows that kind of football drives the bus, we start a Pac-12 schedule in 2026, who knows what that will look like. But at the end of this season, you've got 18 months to, to kind of build on that momentum and, and be able to use the Pac-12 brand as your recruiting pitch. And so you, you need to you need to build on this momentum. And it's an opportunity to build um the fan base uh, kind of reel in the casual fan that's always looked at it at, at Utah state with kind of a side. eye, like, Oh, well, that's great. But Utah did this or, Oh, that's great. But BYU did this. We're always competing with, with those two being in state schools. And we're really only like 120 miles apart between the three of us. And so to see that we, have now made it to the Pac-12. I think if we have an opportunity to reel in the casual fan. Uh, we have an opportunity to reel in some alumni that maybe has distanced themselves just from moving away and, and so on and so forth. And that can really be a give a boost to not only donations, but uh, ticket sales as well. And, and all that kind of stuff is important when you're a part of a national brand when it comes to conference affiliation. Well, so Brian, yesterday, like I said, yesterday was just a massive, massively yeah. huge day in Utah State athletics history. Before we let you go, I want to give you an opportunity, I guess, to shout out some work that you have going on over there at your website. Like I mentioned uh, when we started, he is the uh, – he is all everything. Uh, <laughs> he is the owner of – Big Blue USU Aggie News. Um, I'm assuming in addition to the continued football coverage, probably the next big thing is basketball, right? Basketball starting Definitely. Up soon. Definitely. We, we've had uh, a big 10 days or so in basketball. We've had four verbal commitments. Uh, we're 
a nationally rated, um, according to 24-7 Sports, we're a nationally rated recruiting class right now, sitting at number 17. Uh, so if you click on that, you're, you're looking at, you know, you're looking at Utah State in between schools like Gonzaga and Duke and North Carolina and Arizona. That, that's where we're sitting right now. We pulled in commitments from three four-star guys and a, and a, and a th- high three-star. So we got a lot going on. Uh, Coach Jared Calhoun has really, really um, worked the recruiting trail, him and his staff. And it's it's an exciting time. It's an exciting time to be an Aggie fan. New conference, uh, new basketball coach, and really tearing up the recruiting trail. So it, it's all over on my on my site, BigBlueUSUAggieNews.com. You'll see write ups on all the recruits and where they sit on the national rankings. So yeah, it, it's an exciting time to be an Aggie. And you can find him at Brian Phillips A1 on X. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. Appreciate Brian for joining us on short notice. Thank you guys for watching, showing your support. If you're liking it, if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that like and subscribe button. If you're watching us on X, uh, give us a like, a retweet, and uh, this will be on podcast too. So if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify. Make sure to give us a five-star review, and uh, we appreciate your guys' support. And as always, we are the G55. You might think Iowa grows corn, but the truth is, corn grows Iowa. While farmers work hard to grow the best crop, their Iowa corn checkoff investments are hard at work, too. Opening local and global markets for corn and corn-fed products. Educating drivers on unleaded 88 as the best fuel at the pump. Finding new uses for corn and sharing the farmer's story. Iowa corn farmers are backed by researchers, educators, market experts, and more. To keep corn growing Iowa. With Robinhood Gold, you don't need a silver spoon to eat up the financial favors of the 1%. Robinhood Gold allows the resourceful individual to earn the very liberal rate of 4.5% APY on uninvested cash, receive unlimited 1% deposit bonuses, and be rewarded with a handsome 3% retirement boost on an IRA account. Get the privileges of the high net worth for any net worth for just $5 a month. Sign up at Robinhood.com gold. Terms apply for product-specific disclosures. Visit Robinhood.com gold. Investing involves risk. Rate may change. Gold membership is offered by Robinhood Gold. Gold LLT.